Now it is time for the last word with Jonathan Capehart, who's in for Lawrence. Good evening, my friend. Hey, good evening, Alex. You know, I, I would love to know if we're going to have a classified documents case, but who knows? I mean, I just, you know, prepare a sheet cake with the number not on the cake and <laughs> eat it or not, depending on what happens. That's my right, well, if it's sheet, Well, if it's sheet cake, let's yeah. just eat it anyway. Everyone wins. <laughs> Thanks, have Alex. Have a good show. Thank you. Today, a jury convicted Hunter Biden, the only surviving son of President Joe Biden, of three federal gun felonies. After little less than three hours of deliberations, 12 jurors in President Biden's home state of Delaware agreed with prosecutors that Hunter Biden lied on a mandatory gun purchase form by saying he was not illegally using or addicted to drugs at a time when he was. President Joe Biden responded with this statement. As I said last week, I am the president, but I am also a dad. Jill and I love our son, and we are so proud of the man he is today. I will accept the outcome of this case and will continue to respect the judicial process as Hunter considers an appeal. Jill and I will always be there for Hunter and the rest of our family with our love and support. Nothing will ever change that. He didn't attack the verdict. He didn't say it was rigged. He didn't attack the judge, the prosecutors, or the jury. No, all the wild and irresponsible reaction to the Hunter Burden verdict today came from Republicans, some of whom have embraced the conspiracy myth that the Justice Department charged and convicted Hunter Biden of these felonies to misdirect from other crimes, bigly crimes, unnamed, unspecified, imagined Biden crimes that are much bigger and badder than all the actual crimes Donald Trump is charged with. Ex-Trump advisor Stephen Miller posted the Hunter Biden verdict was proof that DOJ is Joe's election protection racket. The Trump campaign called the verdict a distraction from the real crimes. One right-wing commentator thinks Hunter Biden was prosecuted as cover for the Trump prosecution? The system is fair. You go after Donald Trump and you go after Hunter Biden. Uh, uh, OK, in Republicans defense, you might go a little crazy, too, if you had to defend backing a known fraudster, sexual abuser and now 35, 34 time convicted felon for president in a new op ed. Attorney General Merrick Garland denounced the Republican attacks on the Justice Department. Quote, they are baseless, personal, and dangerous. Today, the DOJ sent a letter to Jim Jordan to confirm that there were no emails between any Justice Department officials and the office of Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg. Quote, the department has no control over the district attorney, just as the district attorney has no control over the department. The committee knows this. Despite that, District Attorney Bragg has agreed to testify before the House on July 12th, the day after Donald Trump's sentencing. A spokesperson for the Manhattan DA's office said, quote, it undermines the rule of law to spread dangerous misinformation, baseless claims, and conspiracy theories following the jury's return of a full count felony conviction in People v. Trump. Nonetheless, we respect our government institutions and plan to appear voluntarily before the subcommittee after sentencing. Joining us now, Neil Katyal, former acting solicitor general of the United States, who's argued more than 50 cases before the Supreme Court. He's a professor at Georgetown Law, an MSNBC legal analyst and host of the podcast Courtside with Neil Katyal. Neil, thank you very much, as always, for being here. So now... <laughs> Some Republicans are pushing the Hunter Biden jury verdict as proof of a DOJ conspiracy. This is some Kerry Matheson red, red yarn all over a corkboard stuff. Did you have that on your bingo card? It's almost impossible. I mean, Jonathan, the verdict today makes these conservative claims look ridiculous. I mean, for years, these conservatives have been crowing about a politicized Justice Department, Biden politicizing it and so on. What happened today? The Justice Department convicted the president's own son, his only living son. I mean, imagine what that would take. Like, let's say you were the attorney general 
and the president gave you that job, Jonathan, you, one of the most important jobs in the country, in the world, and you had the power, as every attorney general does, as Merrick Garland does, to end the prosecution with the stroke of a pen, and mm -hmm. you didn't do it. Garland didn't do it. That's what the rule of law is all about. And similarly, you know, the Constitution gives the president the power to pull the plug on any prosecution. That's part of Article Two. Uh, so Biden, could, President Biden, could have absolutely ended this prosecution once and for all. He didn't do it. That's the test about someone who has convictions in the system. And when it's over, you didn't hear Joe Biden whining about a Trump judge, even though the judge here is literally a Trump judge appointed by Trump. Rather, you heard the president say he would accept the outcome of the case. I know no other word for that but presidential. Mm -hmm. uh, he even went so far as to say he wouldn't pardon his son. Uh, that's how much respect he has for the system. So, so Neil, we saw this with Judge Mershon, and it seems to be with it seems to be Merrick Garland's way too, trying to lower the temperature in the wake of these over-the-top Trump Republican Republican attacks. Do you think he's responding proportionately to the Trumpian all-out war on our ju justice system? I was really glad to see the attorney general's op-ed today in The Washington Post basically saying, look, what the department does is just apply the rule of law and we do so fairly and impartially. That's the Justice Department that I saw, Jonathan, when I worked there in two different administrations. And it's like why people respect this country so much. I mean, this morning I had the privilege of, uh, of speaking at a naturalization ceremony for 150 new citizens from 54 countries. And what do they respect about America? They respect exactly a verdict like this, that, you know, even the president's own son could be convicted by the president's Justice Department and the president's prosecution arm, because this president, as ever, almost every president in our history does, respects the Constitution and respects the rule of law, unlike some of these Republicans like Stephen Miller, who spit on this every chance they can. Mm -hmm. What do you expect to see when Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg testifies before Jim Jordan's subcommittee? Do you think he made the right decision? I expect to see a big nothing. I expect to see all sorts of innuendo akin to the kind of innuendo we're hearing today about how, you know, Joe Biden helped orchestrate the felony conviction of his own son, even though it was overseen <laughs> by a Trump appointed special counsel and adjudicated by a Trump judge. I mean, I'm sure we'll hear, you know, cray cray like that, but there will be no facts because as, you know, the Justice Department even said today, Literally, there was no communication between the prosecutor, Matthew Coangelo, who is the centerpiece of these crazy conspiracy theories, and the Justice Department. Zero. None. So um, have the hearing, by all means, of course. That's part of Congress's responsibilities and oversight. But, you know, it'd be nice to have some facts in those hearings. Yeah, it'd be, be nice to have some. I'm not expecting any, though. <laughs> Neil, Neil Katyal, thank you very much for coming to The Last Word. Thank you. So here's how you know convicted felon Trump knows it could still get much, 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 much worse for him. We have a deranged individual named Jack Smith. He's a deranged, a dumb guy. He's a dumb son of a Convicted felon Trump indicted by special prosecutor Jack Smith on multiple criminal charges for his unsuccessful attempt to overturn the 2020 election also praised the January 6th rioters who attacked the United States Capitol, calling them warriors. Those J6 warriors, they were warriors, but they were really more than anything else. They're victims of what happened. All they were doing is protesting a rigged election. That's what they were doing. While Trump was ranting in Las Vegas Sunday, President Biden was returning from France after commem commemorating the 80th anniversary of D-Day. The Biden campaign has released this ad featuring three American veterans slamming former President Trump for being a draft dodger. A good commander in chief is somebody who gives a shit. My name is Curtis Register. I served in the United States Marine Corps. My name is Ed McCabe. I served from the 1990s into 2014. Hey, my name is Matthew McLaughlin. I was a Navy pilot for eight years. It is the first time I'm shaking the hands of a president of the United States. It was pretty uh, impactful to me to see an individual that supports troops, not just on the battlefield, but when we return home. 
I see a man in Joe Biden who accepts accountability and responsibility. And when I see his predecessor, Donald Trump, I see a man who is only in this for himself. Who criticizes veterans, who doesn't see it important for him to go to the funeral. Donald Trump has zero accountability in his life. He's a draft dodger, simple as that. Yesterday, draft dodger Donald Trump sat for his first probation hearing as a convicted felon, a mandatory requirement before his sentencing on July 11th. Meanwhile, President Biden held a White House event commemorating Juneteenth, a federal holiday he established in 2021 to recognize the emancipation of enslaved African Americans after the Civil War. In his remarks, President Biden reminded the audience why black history is still so important. But let's be clear, they're all ghosts and new garments trying to take us back. Well, there are. Taking away your freedoms, making it harder for black people to vote or have your vote counted. Closing doors of opportunity, attacking the values of diversity, equity, and inclusion. If you can believe it, banning books about black experiences. Trying to erase and rewrite history. Our history is not just about the past. It's about our present and our future. It's whether that future is a future for all of us, not just for some of us. Folks, black history is American history. Black history is American history. Joining us now, former assistant Democratic leader in the House of Representatives, Congressman James Clyburn of South Carolina. He is a national co-chair of the Biden-Harris 2024 campaign. Congressman Clyburn, always great to see you. Welcome back to the show. I was at the Juneteenth Thank event you. last night, and President Biden has touted the Inflation Reduction Act and lowering drug prices. But listen to how the event's host, comedian Roy Wood Jr., talked about that achievement. We have legislation now for cheaper prescription drugs because of this administration. <laughs> Insulin is down to $35 if you're a senior. And I don't know if anybody here has paid for insulin before, but that is like the bottle service of prescription drugs. <laughs> so we appreciate that $35 right there. <laughs> <laughs> Congressman Clyburn, I love the relatability Roy Wood Jr. used to, to break it down. It's funny, but it's telling a, a policy success story. Does the campaign need to do more of that? Well, thank you very much for having me, John. Absolutely. We've got to get this out there. This administration has a record that is unequaled, even cannot even be imagined by a lot of people who thought about these kinds of things as we went into the last election. This administration, uh, with this rescue plan, has brought young children out of poverty with this infrastructure bill, is put in $65 billion for Internet when we had no money for infrastructure in the previous administration, it's CHIP and Science Act, it's PAC Act, uh, it is Inflation Reduction Act. All of these things, people said, could not be done. Joe Biden did them. And I get a little irritated when I hear people telling me, well, he isn't talking loud enough. He isn't <laughs> showing the kind of energy we want. We are about substance, substance not style. That is what will move this country forward. That is what will leave for our children and grandchildren a country to be proud of, real substance. You can talk loud. You can misrepresent. You can prance around. But the question is, what are you doing? You know, I grew up in a postage, and I used to listen to my dad's sermons. And one of the things I learned early, it is their deeds that make them, not their words. And if you get caught up on the words and don't pay any attention to the deeds, you might believe in Donald Trump. But if you're all about deeds, you will be supporting this president, mm -hmm. this administration. Biden and Harris. 
Well, let's talk about some so more deeds, Congressman Clyburn, because today the Biden administration announced that medical debt can no longer be considered in credit scores. And President Biden has made debt elimination one of his main pitches on the campaign, but new polling shows Americans are split on student loan forgiveness. Three in 10 adults approve, while four in 10 disapprove. How concerned are you about that, those polling numbers we see on the screen right there? I think it is because people have misrepresented this whole thing about student loan debt elimination. Joe Biden, if you look at the program, he made it very clear. We are talking about eliminating this compounded interest and all these things that have uh, accumulated beyond what the original debt was. I've got a constituent, not a black constituent, a constituent in North Charleston who wrote a letter to the president with a copy to me. His original loan was $60,000. Over the years, he has paid back nearly $200,000 because of compounded interest and paying for it for more than 20 years and wow. still owed money. So when he eliminated that debt, it was on the compounded interest, not the original loan. And people need to look at that. When I hear Romney, Senator Romney saying that this is a bad deal, how can it be a bad deal? The principal was paid back a long, long, long time ago. These people are paying compounded interest that has been put out there by people who are making money when the original principal was paid back a long time ago. So that's what's going on here. So nobody is paying anybody's debt. They paid mm -hmm. off the debt. It's the compounded interest that people are collecting and that's putting people in the poorhouse, as we say down south. Mm -hmm. Congressman, let me get you on one more thing um, before we have to go in a couple minutes. Let's talk about comments that uh, Entertainment 50 Cent made while on Capitol Hill last week. Listen to this. What do you think of African American men in this election? Thank you, everybody. Both of you. I see them identifying with Trump. Why do you say that? Because they got RICO charges. Congressman Clyburn, your reaction? Black men are moving to Trump because they've got RICO charges? <laughs> Look, he should have been with me last Saturday night at this South Carolina NAACP Freedom Fund dinner. A hundred percent support for Joe Biden. Not one single person in there, male or female, fought Donald Trump. He should have been with me at Greater Target Memorial AME Church on Sunday morning, 100 percent for Joe Biden, not a single person there for Donald Trump. I don't know where 50 Cent is hanging out, but I hang out with the NAACP. I hang out uh, with the black community, black faith community, and I don't see any support for Donald Trump. These people aren't worried about RICO statutes. They're working, worrying about their children's student loan debt. They're worried about uh, the cost of insulin when it comes uh, to their uh, health care. They're worried about affordable housing. They're worried about broadband deployment. That's what they're getting uh, from this president. And they aren't thinking about whatever it is the 50 Cent is talking about in RICO statutes. The RICO statutes down in Georgia, that is what Donald Trump violated. And so we are upset because he is being called uh, to account for violating the RICO statutes. Come on, 50 cents. Uh, that's worth a dollar to know better. <laughs> Congressman James Clyburn, always great to see you. Thank you for coming to The Last Word. Thank you very much for having me. All right, 50 cents. Coming up, we are 11 days into Pride Month, and there's one person I know who isn't celebrating. Justice Samuel Alito's wife has been caught on tape sharing her exasperation at seeing Pride flags from her house. And that's not the only reason we should be worried about uh, what's on those secret recordings. And that's next.
My wife is fond of flying flags. That is what Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito said when he blamed his wife for flying two different flags at their homes that are associated with the Stop the Steal movement and carried by rioters at the January 6th insurrection. New secret recordings of his wife, Martha Ann Alito, are re revealing more about what motivates her to fly flags. You know what I want? I want a sacred heart of Jesus flag because I have to look across the lagoon at the pride flag for the next month. Exactly. And, and he's like, oh, please don't put up a flag. I said, I won't do it because I'm deferring to you. But when you are free of this nonsense, I'm putting it up and I'm going to send them a message every day. Maybe every week I'll be changing the flags. There'll be all kinds. I made a flag in my head. This is how I, I satisfy myself. I made a flag. It's white and it's yellow and orange flames around it. And and in the middle is the word vergogna. Vergogna in Italian means shame. <laughs> that is the wife of a Supreme Court justice being openly hostile to a complete stranger about the pride flag, a symbol of freedom and equality for the LGBTQ plus community during Pride Month. People like me, being proud of who they are makes her mad. It makes her want to send them a message. It makes her want to fly a flag that says shame. This is not a woman who is unclear about the message of the flags that she's flying. And for what it's worth, I don't think anyone would care if they looked across the Potomac and saw a Jesus flag flying. There are lots of Martha Ann's in America who also harbored this kind of grievance. But this is Martha Ann Alito. She's not just any random person. She's married to a Supreme Court justice for life, one of the most powerful people in the country who's actively rolling back Americans' constitutional rights. Justice Alito authored the majority opinion revoking nearly 50 years of rights for women when the court overturned Roe versus Wade. And that laid the foundation for another right-wing justice with a right-wing wife, Clarence Thomas, to target the LGBTQ plus community by saying the Supreme Court should reconsider two cases that affirm the rights of same-sex couples, including same-sex marriage. Martha Ann Alito longs for the day when 74-year-old Justice Alito is, quote, free of all this nonsense. She's thinking about who will replace him on the court. Are you? Joining me now, Kelly Robinson, president of the Human Rights Campaign. Kelly, thank you for coming back to The Last Word. Your reaction to what we heard from Mrs. Alito. Shocking. And also not shocking in the same sense. I mean, what she's saying about flags, it's not about flags. It's a dog whistle to MAGA bullies across the board. What she wants to do is use the flag as a symbol to talk about how they want to erase us from public life, to push us back into the closet. And when I think about what today rec represents, not only is it Pride Month, but tomorrow represents eight years since the Pulse mass shooting where 49 members mm. of our community, their lives were stolen forever. This kind of violent action and political rhetoric, it leads to real world outcomes. So anyone that's listening to her, anyone that's watching what she says should be very, very concerned, not only about her words, but what it means in terms of the actions of people that are listening to her. Mm -hmm. There's audio, uh, new audio from Justice Alito tonight. Listen. I just wanted to ask you, why do you think the Supreme Court is so, has been so attacked and being so targeted by the media these days? Well, I think it's a simple reason they don't like our decisions and they don't like how they anticipate we may decide some cases that are coming up. That's, that's the beginning and the end of it. Um, Kelly, does this sound ominous given the two abortion cases and two January 6 cases yet to be decided this term? To me, it sounds hypocritical. I mean, I remember when Barack Obama wore a tan suit and people acted like it was the end of democracy. <laughs> their minds. We're talking about <laughs> right. And now we're talking about a whole Supreme Court justice whose wife is saying things like this, who's espousing these beliefs that are concerning for someone that's on the highest court of the land. So I do think that anyone that is listening to the words that are coming out of Justice Alito's mouth, you should be concerned. 
But I also know that if you're a person of color, if you're an LGBTQ plus person, if you're a woman or someone who's non-binary, we don't have the luxury of letting our concern and fear put us into a state of paralysis. We have to understand that this is why it is more critical than ever that we get out and we vote this November. Our lives are quite literally at stake. Mm -hmm. You know, Trump is out there giving comfort to anti-abortion groups promising to, quote, defend life, while Republicans are not voting to protect conception. Today, a federal judge struck down a Florida ban on transgender care for minors. These all sound like the sound like rights this ideological Supreme Court has no interest in protecting. They don't. They've said the quiet part out loud already. I mean, we have to remember that when Roe v. Wade was overturned and Justice Thomas's, Clarence Thomas's concurrence, he said out loud the next the court should revisit Obergefell. They should revisit Lawrence. They should re revisit Griswold. These are cases that fundamentally asserted our basic rights as LGBTQ plus people in this country and our right to contraception. So anytime they say that these things aren't on the table, that these rights are not at risk, look at what they are doing. We mm -hmm. should all, again, be very concerned about what we're seeing, but also take it as a call to action. Because at the end of the day, we still live in a democracy. Our votes right. still count. And there's something that we can do right now about how this court has gotten so far disconnected from its actual mission in our democracy. Yeah, uh, as I mentioned before, I was at the Juneteenth event where I met your beautiful wife last night. But that's not the point why I'm bringing that up. I want to uh, play something um, uh, that Vice President Harris said last night. Watch. Across our nation, we witness a full-on attack on hard-fought, hard-won freedoms and rights, including the freedom of a woman to make decisions about her own body, the freedom to be who you are and love who you love openly and with pride, the freedom from fear of bigotry and hate, the freedom to learn and acknowledge our nation's true and full history, and the freedom that unlocks all others, the freedom to vote. How important is it to stress to voters that the Supreme Court is on the ballot in November? What's at stake is more Samuel Alitos or more Katanji Brown Jacksons? Exactly. I mean, that's what I saw from Kamala Harris right now. That is leadership. And at the end of the day, when we think about this election that's coming up, it's not just about two candidates. It's actually about two fundamentally different visions for our country, two fundamentally different visions for our futures and for our children. And at the end of the day, when you talk to people, regardless of where they are in the political spectrum, a lot of our fears are the same. Worried that your kids will have a better life than you do today. Concerns about inflation, making sure that schools are good and welcoming and safe. But I want to make sure that whoever we elect, that their solutions are about moving us forward and not pulling us back. And what the Supreme Court has shown that they are willing to do from the the overturn of Roe v. Wade to all that they have said and done in the last year, they are willing to roll back the rights, not only the last 10 years or last 40 years, but the last 100. We have got to do something about it for the sake of all of our communities, and especially for the sake of our kids. Kelly Robinson, president of the Human Rights Campaign, thank you very much for coming to The Last Word. Thank you. Coming up, it's election night in Nevada. It's a must-win state for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and a must-win seat for Democrats if they hope to hold on to the Senate. Nevada Senator Jackie Rosen joins us next. It's primary night in Nevada, and on Sunday, Donald Trump issued this warning for voters. If we win Nevada, we win the whole thing. Donald Trump is vying for Nevada's six electoral votes in a state that has not voted for a Republican for president since George W. Bush won re-election two decades ago. In fact, Joe Biden won Nevada by 33,596 votes. And Republicans haven't won a, seat, a Senate, seat, Senate race in Nevada since 2012. But in 2022, Democrat Steve Sisolak became the only incumbent to lose re-election that year. Voters across the state cast their ballots in today's primary election. The polls close at 10 p.m. Eastern, but it is still too early to call the Republican Senate primary. With less than five months until Election Day, Donald Trump told his supporters exactly what he thinks of them. 
I don't care about you. I just want your vote. I don't care. Joining us now, Democratic Senator Jackie Rosen of Nevada. She is a member of the Armed Services Committee and is running for re-election to the U.S. Senate in 2024. Senator Rosen, thank you for being here. Donald Trump called you a, quote, terrible senator at that rally mm -hmm. on Sunday because he knows if you win, it will be you and not a Republican voting for federal judges and abortion uh, legislation and a whole host of other issues. Well, let's be clear. Donald Trump lost Nevada twice, and that's a fact. And he clearly doesn't know about Nevada, because if he did, he would know that I have a record, and I have a record of being one of the top 10 most bipartisan senators overall, the top 10 most effective Democratic senators, and the top two most independent Democratic senators serving in the Senate. Nevada voters are pragmatic. They want someone who's going to support a women's right for reproductive freedom to get that reproductive health care. My presumptive opponent, Sam Brown, he wants to take away those rights. He wants to sit in your doctor's office looking over your shoulder. Nevadans want me to continue to protect Social Security and Medicare like we did when we lowered the prices for prescription drugs, giving $35 insulin. Sam Brown and MAG extremists want to take that away. I don't know about Sam Brown, but I took care of my parents and in-laws as they aged. I would never, never want to hurt them, never want them to pay higher prices. I don't know what he's thinking, but I'm going to protect seniors. I always have. And so Donald Trump doesn't know our state. There's a clear choice here. There's a senator who wakes up every day putting Nevadans first, has a bipartisan pragmatic record to deliver on, or someone who only puts Donald Trump first. That would be Sam Brown. Mm -hmm. Senator, Voter Latino recently conducted a poll of 2,000 Latino voters in five swing states, including Nevada, and mm -hmm. found that 18 percent or about one-fifth of likely Latino voters are considering voting for a candidate other than President Biden or Donald Trump. Senator Rosen, how are Democrats reaching out to and mobilizing Latino voters? Well, I can tell you, Latino voters in Nevada, they are the decisive vote. And I can also tell you that my team in Nevada, so many of them born and raised in Nevada, I myself lived there for the last 50 years, just about. And so we're in the community all the time. We are listening and we are responding. I can tell you, I sit on the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Committee, and when I talk to our Latin Chamber of Commerce, we talk about all the Latino small businesses, so many entrepreneurs. We want to be sure that they have all the tools that they need to keep and start their small business and thrive. We talk about affordable health care. It's really, really important. And we talk about education, and our environment. And we're connecting with our Latino voters every single day on the issues that matter to them. Kitchen table issues, the same issues that matter to everybody else. Mm -hmm. Senator Rosen, the, the late longtime Nevada Senator Harry Reid built a famous statewide Democratic organization in, in Nevada. Is the Reid machine still in effect in Nevada? Well, what Senator Reid did was really build what they call a coordinated campaign. So what that means for our Nevada State Democratic Party, all of the candidates, the incumbents and the candidates are running, we work together to be sure that we, we go knock on doors, we do our field program, we're talking about the issues, we coordinate. That's really was the magic, being sure that we were communicating, working together, bringing people together, because Nevada families it really matter. And listening to them and delivering for them really matters. Like delivering for our seniors. I can tell you for our veterans, we passed the PACT Act, you know, up in northern Nevada and Reno. We're going to have the new VA hospital. They're searching for that 50-acre site now. It's going to be a game changer for the veterans in northern Nevada. So whether it's our seniors, our veterans, our students, or our tourism economy, we're listening and we're delivering. Senator Jackie Rosen of Nevada, thank you very much for coming to The Last Word. Thank you for having me. And coming up, Biden is beating Trump in a new election forecast. And one of the big reasons is Biden's strength in the key swing state of Wisconsin, and particularly with a group of voters who make up the bulk of the Trump base. That's next. Today, 538 released its election forecast showing Joe Biden is slightly favored to beat Donald Trump in November. The reason? The fundamentals favor Biden. 
And according to 538, Biden currently has a better chance of winning Pennsylvania and all the blue wall states of Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. My newspaper, The Washington Post, has a new report about President Biden's success so far in Wisconsin, where Republicans will officially renominate convicted felon Donald Trump at their national convention next month, particularly with white non-college voters who make up the Trump base. The Post reports, Wisconsin Democrats attribute part of Biden's relative strength with white voters without degrees to a rural progressive tradition that has not that has faded but not disappeared, and part of it to tenacious organizing, including in rural areas where many of those voters live. Biden's campaign is investing in an unprecedented field operation in Wisconsin with 47 coordinated campaign offices across the state, more offices than Biden has in any other battleground state, and far more than Republicans have in Wisconsin, staffed by more than 100 full-time campaign workers. Even ousted Wisconsin Republican Governor Scott Walker admitted to The Post, quote, the organization is on the side of the left. Joining us now, Ben Wickler, Wisconsin Democratic Party Chair, and Sandy Rindy, who is the Green County Wisconsin Democratic Party Chair. Thank you both very much for coming to The Last Word. Ben, you've worked tirelessly, tirelessly to defeat the Scott Walker GOP machine in Wisconsin, but it still must feel pretty good to, to have Walker praise Democratic organization. It does feel good. It is the result of a huge amount of work by thousands of people in the most rural parts of our state, in suburbs, in small towns, in big towns and cities. Our motto is we work statewide and year round. We don't take anyone for granted and we don't write anyone off. That's what it takes to win in a state like Wisconsin. But you can see the results in the numbers. It's a very exciting moment. Mm -hmm. And if we win Wisconsin, we win the White House. And Sandy, tell us about the Green County voters that you're reaching out to. Is this looking for 2020 Biden voters who might be going soft or a true undecided voter? What issues do they care about? Well, I think the issues they care about are the real kitchen table issues that a lot of us have been talking about, the um, affordable care, uh, health care, our women's reproductive rights, voting rights saving our democracy, good education and child care, uh, basically kitchen table issues. That's what we're mm -hmm. hearing about. And what do you say back to them when you hear about these ki kitchen table slash economic issues? Well, we talked to them about some of the issues that President Biden and Kamala Harris have already put forward and uh, the unemployment, the jobs that have been created. Uh, monies that have come into Greene County for various things, such as um, our YMCA in our county seat in the city of Monroe. Um, we've received funding for that. Uh, basic issues like that. We, we mm -hmm. try to point out to people what is being done. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side, Sandy, on the ground, what do you hear from voters about Donald Trump, if anything? Uh, that they really don't want to have him back in office. <laughs> <laughs> Simple as that. Simple as that. So, so Ben, how how are voters how voters get their information has changed much more now in social media than via traditional ads or newspaper editorials, which you know br breaks my heart as an opinion writer. But how has that changed voter outreach? The first thing we have to assume is that there's no silver bullet. You might get something on the local evening news that reaches some voters. Some voters, especially in rural areas, are reading the weekly newspaper that, that you know comes in. Uh, maybe they pick it up at the grocery store. We have to really be everywhere. Social media platforms on any screen that someone might be near, billboards, yard signs, barn signs, door-to-door -door organizing, phone calls, text messages, uh, show up at parades, show up at county fairs. We try to build a surround sound environment so that people hear from trusted messengers wherever they might be. And uh, we assume that just because you've said something somewhere doesn't mean that anyone's heard it. You have to say it everywhere, mm -hmm. over and over and over. Uh, that's what it's going to take. And we'll have to cut through the noise because there's going to be such a din this year. Trump is trying to confuse people. He's trying to throw people off. We need to bring people's focus back to what affects them directly 
directly, their freedom, their freedom to make their own decisions about their own body, to live in a democracy, and who's fighting for them. Biden and Harris, you know, fighting special interests and bringing down costs, and Trump promising wealthy donors whatever they want. That message, that contrast does resonate for people, but you have to go where the voters are and not expect them to come to you. Mm -hmm. Sandy, I see you. You've been nodding in agreement uh, since Ben is answering that question. But my, my last question to you is, if President Biden were to come to Greene County and ask your advice on what he should say to voters, what would you tell him? Wow. Ah, that's a good question. Um, I guess— I guess just to be right, you know, honest with him and what he plans to do for the voters, listening to him, I think is the most important thing is listening to the voters and what their issues are and then being able to address those. Mm -hmm. um, I know that if President Biden could come to Green County, they would be ecstatic. <laughs> You know, Ben, I can't tell time, so we actually have about 90 seconds left. So same question to you. What would you say to Team Biden? Uh, what would you say they need to work on or, or watch out for? Well, we love President Biden coming to our state because he does listen to people. And when they hear from him, they move towards him. When they hear from Trump, they move away from him. We also have local candidates. We have 97 out of 99 assembly districts covered with local candidates. We're organizing everywhere. Our uh, website is wisdems.org for anyone who wants to help us organize, volunteer, chip in. And what I what I love when President Biden comes to our state and does is he really digs into what he's delivering and what he wants to do. He recently announced a $3.3 billion investment by Microsoft outside of Racine uh, in a community where Trump showed up and promised the sun, moon, and stars with a golden shovel and never really did anything. That contrast really lands for people that are you know, wondering what job they'll be working in over the next 10 years. When President Biden shows up and actually does something, it clicks. So we want more. We, we love the president's visit. We want him to keep coming. And we think we can draw a real contrast with Trump, who talks big, delivers nothing, and then tries to hoard it all for himself and use his power to exact revenge instead of serving the people. Yeah, I think it's guaranteed President Biden and Vice President Harris will be back in Wisconsin multiple times before we get to Election Day. Ben Wickler, Sandy Rindy, thank you both very much for coming to The Last Word. Thank you. And we'll be right back. That is tonight's last word.